Thank you. Good morning. I'm uh, not projecting at all. I don't know if we, I guess we can just go with the blue screen. Uh, since this is amateur hour, and Stephen made that clear, like he was just sort of like, do, do what you want to do. I had a nice package talk, and uh, just something didn't sit right. I just felt that this would be the wrong crowd for a nice package talk. So I am instead, uh, I'm working on a book about web pages. It's a set of literary essays about web pages, and that is, uh, don't do that if you ever had the idea to do that. It's a terrible mistake about three or four months in. You'll realize that by saying to a regular publisher that you want to explain the web to all, all of humanity in all of its glory, that you've made a terrible error and that the web is enormous and terrifying and never ends. But what I want to do is talk, um, I'm going to read some sections from the book in progress and, and where I'm at. And uh, I'm doing this like in the same way that comedians go on stage and work out their material. I'm doing this to like check the reaction and to, to get feedback. And if you give me feedback, I have these, you can't really see them clearly, but in 1992, the, the Tim Berners-Lee and Robert Cayo and a few other people walked around the world and gave a talk about the web, and they had transparencies. They didn't have PowerPoint at that point. And there's this great little World Wide Web logo, the typical www. It's green, and the reason it's green is that Robert Cayo, I think that's how you pronounce his name, who created it, with, uh, was, has synesthesia, and so all Ws are green to him. Uh, fun web fact. And the, so it just says on the bottom, I've got these little stickers, they fit, they do actually pretty well on the laptop, and I'd like to replace the Apple with it. Um, let's share what we know. That was the initial uh, motto or tagline for the World Wide Web. And um, it's not that way necessarily anymore. I don't feel that when people sit down to create a new enterprise, the first thing they think is, is let's share what we know. And I've been thinking a lot about that, and I've been thinking a lot, um, well, let me just start reading. We'll see where it goes. I live on uh, Coney Island Avenue in Brooklyn, New York, and this is a very intense street. It runs all the way from the south of Prospect Park, which is the, that's the big park in, in Brooklyn, sort of like Brooklyn Central Park, uh, out to Coney Island, where you can ride a roller coaster. You guys know Coney Island. And it has everything, but it doesn't have everything in any kind of order. It has this like incredibly crowded used bookstore, crowded with books, but nobody knows about this place. And it's often ranked as one of the best bookstores in the city. I just like to tell people about it. But, and, and it's called Here's a Bookstore, which is kind of unambiguous, but nobody knows where it is. Um, and also on Coney Island Avenue, you'll find a, a Staples, you'll find all the regular stuff, Dunkin' Donuts and so on. And there's an Orthodox Jewish hat store, and it has a big hat outside, which I love because I love places that have big versions of the things they sell, because that is also really unambiguous. Like, is it, does that place sell ice cream? Well, it has a giant ice cream cone, and, and, uh, and I love that. And it also has a neighborhood called Little Pakistan. So just this incredible variety of things going on on Coney Island Avenue. I love to walk up and down it. Oh, it also has a... a it just closed down, but it has a garage called The Body Shop, and there's a strip club upstairs also called The Body Shop. <laughs> so, it's a very wide variety. We never, uh, I live, in, because I have these small twins, um, that they were like two weeks old for the first Monktoberfest, and my wife was like, no. <laughs> um, but uh, it's a lot of parents in our building, and all the guys are like, at like 8.30 p.m., they'll be like, we'll have a, people be hanging out, they'll be like, we should go to the body shop, and all the wives just go, go ahead, let's see if you can stay awake after 9.30. <laughs> um, so it's sort of a thing we talk about. Anyway, I, as I walk around, uh, I keep coming back to a different question, and, and that question is, you know, sort of why is that there? Why is little Pakistan here? Why do we live on this block? Why is that store there? Just sort of these really fundamental questions, like why is that bus, where did, who decided that that bus goes up and down the street? And um, Little Pakistan's actually a great example. It's the people who moved there were displaced in the 1960s. They're Kashmiris, and they were displaced by the construction of the Mangla Dam. Uh, and, and the government of Pakistan needed that dam. They decided they wanted that dam. It's the ninth largest in the world. It's a big dam. And um, they removed 280 towns and, and displaced 100,000 people in order to build it. So 
as a result of that specific decision, you can get um, really good curry on Coney Island Avenue. Like it's just a very specific one-on-one -on -one and lots of other things. I mean, it's a very vibrant culture. Um, and then if you go in another direction and you go all the way back, a lot of the major thoroughfares in New York City are actually paths that Native Americans uh, took to go about their lives. And uh, like King's Highway in Brooklyn, that was one. It's, it's sort of ridiculous because it was an Indian path and we took it over and named it for the king and then we had a revolution which was fought in Brooklyn partly and, and the, to get the king out of there but it's still King's Highway. Names are very, very sticky things, right? They have this way of lingering. Broadway's like that too. Like Broadway was an Indian path and like down around Wall Street. So this model of the world, the way that we see things, when we talk about Wall Street, the spaces that we live inside, these were put down by people who had absolutely no idea what was coming next. There was no planning. Uh, there was just someone trying to get from point A to point B and then someone shows up a little later and they have a slightly different version of point A and point B. And you just keep building on that over and over and over over hundreds of years. So there are these touchstone quotes. This will get a little like serious for just a minute here. There are these touchstone quotes that you come back to in your life. And there's one, I first read this in like high school. And I can't get this out of my head. It's, it's from the Tao Te Ching. It's, it's from Lao Tzu. So, you know, it's, I'm from New York, not San Francisco, but indulge me. Um, and it's this. 30 spokes joined together in the hub. It is because of what is not that the cart is useful. Clay is formed into a vessel. It is because of its emptiness that the vessel is useful. Cut doors and windows to make a room. It is because of its emptiness that the room is useful. Therefore, what is present is used for profit. But it is in absence that there is usefulness. So in particular, those last two lines. Therefore, what is present is used for profit, but it's absence that there is usefulness. So that's what I want to talk about for a few more minutes. I want to talk about, if you'll indulge me, absences. And I think to, to do that effectively, I'm realizing I need to talk a little bit about the concept of talent. And what I mean about that is that we talk a lot about talent in our culture as, as nerds, but also in the larger culture, it's also a huge issue. And um, honestly, if you want to sell a lot of books, don't write about web pages, which I'm doing. Write a book about talent, like Malcolm Gladwell. Um, he gets into that with outliers with that 10,000 hours rule. And I'm sure everybody has heard some variation of that, which is that if you give 10,000 hours doing something, so kind of five working years essentially, but spread out, um, you become an expert, you become a world class, you can be world class. And people talk about talent this way. They're, they're like, you know, there's tons of these books, tons of guides to developing talent, hiring talent, corralling talent, and it's seen as this really positive thing, this really great aspect of humans that we are talented. But the thing that bugs me, and, and I think this is relevant to this room, how does one become motivated to spend 10,000 hours on anything? Uh, and people ask me sometimes, like, how do you get pieces into big national magazines? I, I write for you know, places like Wired or even Elle magazine. And, and the thing is, there are ways. There actually are specific, like, well, you pitch this way, and you talk to these people, and you, you have to make your story kind of have these kind of angles. But it really does come down to the time. It comes down to the fact that I have a million words behind me. I have 10,000 hours. And there's a kind of set of understandings that I have with magazine editors. And it's, it's hard to say that out loud because it sounds a little pretentious, but I just I have the work in. And so I, I get to sort of cash in on that in certain ways that are probably not available to everybody. But that 10,000 hours, and everyone in this room probably has some variation on it, it's not all happy. You know, the way it, it works is that, you know, the way it practically works, somebody calls me up and says, we need 6,000 words about X. And I start, and I start to think, and I start to actually, like I can feel it, my, my hands start to do this. I'm like, eh, and I start walking around, and I see this gap, I see this emptiness that I have to fill with words. They're like, we need you to write about, I don't know, fertility treatments or technology or whatever. And, but I start to see the scaffolding and I start to see the pattern. And it's not necessarily a pleasant process. I know it, I live it, I like it, but it's sort of like you're trying to, find, you're trying to sort of scratch an itch. And, and like I said, this is a room of talented people. And I think increasingly as I work with talented people, as I spend time around them, as I sometimes manage them, I'm realizing that when we talk about talent, what we're really talking about is very, very annoyed individuals. <laughs> like, and I mean, it's positive, right? We'd all be here without the beer, but the reason, you know, you, you know, we really would. We'd be here because we want to solve problems. We're all people who our hands start kind of moving and we're like, ah, oh, I got to fix it. And 
so I'm feeling that talent, I'm thinking that talent is this incredible ability to be annoyed. It's the sensitivity. And you, you, you start to frown and everything goes out the window and sometimes families are ignored, phones unanswered. And I think honestly maturity for me has been defined in dealing with that, in, in deciding to put aside the problem and stay at home, spend time you know, with the people who matter to me. Um, but things have to be right. And you know, a trick I've learned too, if I'm managing someone, like if I'm managing a designer and I want them to do something and they're not doing it for whatever reason, because talented people are talented people and they behave certain ways, I just do it. I'm like, ah, oh, you need the logo? Well, here, let me sketch one for you. Or I'll open Photoshop and start to design the website. And they go bananas. Like they will fix that right away. Things that you just send them the comp, you're like, I think it should look like this. And they're like, hell no, it's not gonna look like that. <laughs> it's a great trick, just do their work like 5% of it and people will always step in right away and fix your problem because they, they can't, it's just like, it's just that tension so profound. And there's a scene, there's also, there's a great scene in Walter Isaacson's biography of Steve Jobs where Steve, I mean it's a sad scene, Steve Jobs is in the hospital and he's supposed to wear this oxygen mask and here's the quote, Jobs ripped it off and mumbled that he hated the design and refused to wear it. The bear <laughs> Though barely able to speak, he ordered them to bring five different options for the mask, and he'd pick a design he liked. He also hated the oxygen monitor they put on his finger. He told them it was ugly and too complex. So you can see, that's a guy who couldn't leave it alone, right? It's a terrible scene. It's sort of a hilarious scene to those of us who kind of get that tension, but he couldn't leave it behind even for a minute, even, in, even when he was sort of you know, under the knife. I had a recruiter write me once and say that he'd like to talk to me because I use GitHub and other object-oriented languages. <laughs> <laughs> Which, you know, it's just such a profound semantic fail, but it got me thinking. We keep thinking of talent in terms of tools and skills, and we all know it's not that. You know, we know that it's the person who's capable of seeing the gap, identifying the absence, and taking steps across it. And they need to know certain things, but the reason they learn them. I didn't learn Python because I wanted to understand uh, the mission of Python. I learned Python because I wanted to, and Perl, and PHP, and so because I wanted to build certain things. I couldn't get them out of my head, and so it was worthwhile to learn the language. And no recruiter would ever say that. Like, no recruiter's ever like, do you, have a, do you get constructively annoyed by things enough to learn programming languages? <laughs> but, but we all know that that's actually a more constructive question. I would far, I mean, if somebody asked me that, and the truth is, when you work on really interesting projects, that's kind of how you find people. You find them at, at places like this, where you're like, oh, yeah, that, you know, that was really frustrating, and I can't believe that the standards body did that, that was a terrible move, and so on, and, and then people kind of congeal around that shared understanding, way more than they do a, a list of skills. It doesn't mean that skills don't matter, it's just that ability to perceive an absence and be constructively annoyed actually matters more. So, this has got me thinking about the technology that I use in a different way. Um, because I, you know, I, I think about frameworks and programming languages and the web and REST and I like Python, I like Django, I use Postgres, you know, I, I, that's my world. But that's not really the web anymore. Like HTML5 has this API for battery life. I keep thinking about that. That has nothing to do with documents. You know, it doesn't have anything to do with the old web and links. It's about hardware. It's no longer very abstract. It's this low-level thing. And the idea is actually that your, your um, front-end web app might have a low power mode for like if you're doing an email client. You're gonna wanna like slow down the number of times you're checking email over Ajax. Um, so it's worthwhile to know where the battery's at. So it's, it's practical. It should probably be there if the web's gonna be an operating system. But it doesn't have anything to do with that. It's, it's weird in a kind of let's share what we know, spread the documents, abstraction layer. But, so the web started as a publication platform, a way to link documents. It has this new role, which is that it's very fast and very reactive, right? It can react to the computer in your hand, to computers thousands of miles away. And that started, that brought up a, a, a stray thought about an old software project called Amaya, uh, which was produced by the World Wide Web Consortium. And it stopped development, I think, around 2010 in any meaningful way, but it was pretty, it was funded and, and it was a web editor. It was a browser and editor at once. And uh, the way they described it was, it's a web editor, a tool used to create and update documents directly on the web, 
Browsing features are seamlessly integrated with the editing and remote access features in a uniform environment. This follows the original vision of the web as a space for collaboration and not just a one-way publishing medium. So start thinking about what the web would have looked like if this model had taken hold, right? Because you wouldn't have needed databases in the same way. Databases are kind of this silent partner to the client and server. You know, I mean, not in our world, we know all about them, but users, users don't perceive them. But you can't, like the editable web that we have now is because you can fill out a form, something gets saved to a database of any sort, SQL, NoSQL, um, and then the, the middleware will sort of fetch that out and, and create views for it, right? And it, it quickly, um, but, but we didn't have this sort of easily editable any web page strategy that was the original part of the web. We had forms and we had text boxes. And you have to wonder what the web would have looked like if we hadn't had those things. I mean, it would have been possible to publish without using the forms, without the text boxes. It would have been possible to get your voice out there without a blogging platform or Twitter or a special service. You would have, that would have been what you'd been buying, this ability to edit your web pages. And you have to wonder at a more fundamental level, would Amazon have had its reviews and its catalog and reviews and rankings, which in turn led to AWS? Would Oracle have bought Sun or the other way around? Would anyone have come up with wikis if the whole web had been natively a kind of wiki? Would you have been able to consolidate people around a single database and then make Wikipedia? Amazon and Wikipedia and Twitter and Facebook and, uh, and archive.org, they have these data models that capture a ton of human behavior. Um, and at and, and some level, this entire world that we know, all its $2 trillion of economic development, is, a, is related to in-browser editing not working, to, like, to, that, to Amaya not succeeding, to little tiny text boxes and forms getting filled out with very simple pieces of text and getting logged in the databases. We had to fall back to web forms because the vision wasn't quite there yet. Um, and it feels a little bit, just a little bit, like those Indian trails turning into Broadway. I'm going to read something very, uh, that, that's, it's about to come out in the MIT Technology Review. Related to this, it's, uh, uh, it's about the quest for the perfect document. Not long ago, the hypertext pioneer Ted Nelson, who carried the flame of hypertext for decades before the web, gave a talk at the Museum of Modern Art in New York City. He said, I don't know anybody from my generation of computer people that has adapted because we all had original visions. Now his vision is and was of sort of interconnected documents, those two-way documents where any part of anything can connect to anything else. And he loathes the new formats. He loathes HTML, PDF, and Word for aiming so low. He says, I think every quotation should be connected instantly to its source, meaning not just links, which go only one direction, pointing outward from one document to another, but something more profound, texts that are transcluded from other texts which are comprised of yet other texts. And it's a lovely vision in which there are no copies and only originals, but it has proven unworkable as a consumer product for years, for decades. But Nelson, he's got this beautiful voice, and he's very dramatic, and he says, for this, the conventional computer people call me crazy or a clown or a pariah, and then his demo just imploded. It was great. It was just sort of like, <laughs> he's just struggling with the computer right after that, and he can't get, can't get Windows up, and he's like running Windows inside of Parallels, and you're just like, oh, just this horrible like five minutes uh, as the computer industry actually did seem to be having its revenge. So for much of his life, Ted Nelson, who you should really look up, he wrote a book in 1972 called uh, computer lib slash dream machines that defines a lot of the world we live in in a very specific way. Like he really, like when people were mostly dealing with punch cards, he actually could see a lot of the patterns that we exist inside of. So a brilliant and innovative and very, very difficult thinker. And, and he's clearly thrived on this sense of opposition, questioning the conventional wisdom of computing, putting forth a vision that remains elusive. And here he is on stage though, telling the story of his product and his hopes decade after decade, and it's very easy to criticize products that don't ship and the people who don't ship them, but it's also possible to look at his body of work, his many self-published, self-assembled books, his demos, his talks, and see a system of thought that exists outside the pale of mass computer consumer culture and appreciate it and even celebrate it for what it is. It's a man's dream, it's a concept, it's even a kind of art. 
And Doug Engelbart, who recently passed away, was a friend of Ted Nelson. Ted Nelson. He died in early July. And he's described in his obituaries as, the, as a pioneer of hypertext and the co-inventor of the mouse. But the mouse was a means to an end for him. It was a tool for navigating two-dimensional space in his NLS system, this, which he famously demonstrated in 1968. And that was a system that offered this sort of barely fathomable features for teleconferencing, hypertext, real-time collaboration, all in the interest of augmenting human in intellect, of making it possible for human beings to think new kinds of thoughts made possible by the speed and the elegance of the programmable digital computer. And frustrated by this mouse-driven coverage of Engelbart's death, a very brilliant programmer named Brett Victor, who is definitely an inheritor of this Engelbart ethos, he wrote, he wrote this on a, on a blog post, if you attempt to make sense of Engelbart's design by drawing correspondences to our present day systems, you'll miss the point. Our present day systems do not embody Engelbart's intent. He hated our present day systems. The most important question you can ask about Engelbart, he concluded, is what world was he trying to create? By asking that question, you put yourself in a position to create that world yourself. And the guy who filmed Engelbart's demo was named Stuart Brand. And he went on to found the Whole Earth Catalog, and, uh, he, which actually also became linked to The Well, which was in the early online communities. But in 1984, he wrote this book, it's totally worth buying from Amazon, um, called The Whole Earth Software Catalog. It's like this thin, and you could fit the whole computer industry in a book. And, uh, and it actually, just like the language is so wonderful. It's you know, on an unlovely flat artifact called a disk may be hidden the concentrated intelligence of thousands of hours of design. I just love that. It's such a great way to describe software. And he also wrote this about software, which I, I love and I just sort of have in my head a lot now. Software, when it's used at all intensely, comes to feel like an extension of your nervous system. Its habits become your habits. The reason the term personal got stuck to these personal computers is that they become part of your person. And then as a postscript, the last two, the last two words are buyer beware. <laughs> a few more things. Should I keep going? Yes. Okay. <laughs> iOS 7 is finally out. The web is just relaxing in its anguish over skeuomorphs. What's a skeuomorph? According to a dictionary of architecture, it's an object whose shape or decoration copies the form of the object originally made from another material. A good example was the desk calendar on old versions of iOS where it looked, or the, the calendar which would look like a calendar. These sort of old kind of retro looking uh, you know, things that, that look like leather, like the way that LinkedIn has a kind of leather texture in its app like it's a binder. Um, but now, finally, September 2013, we have relaxed the anguish. A new version of iOS has come out and it, it's all clean lines. Nothing looks like a desk calendar, it looks like its own thing. There's no more fake leather. And the design community, the web design community, the internet, the app design community can breathe a sigh of relief. Apple is no longer doing the terrible, awful thing it was doing. The thing that I find interesting, though, as I watch all this drama, and people were very upset over Skeuomorphs. They thought it was really important that Apple sort of back off and make things look clean and light and, and sort of uh, uh, less like the 3D world. But I'm trying to learn like, just enough assembly language to actually understand how computers really work. And the further down I go, the more I realize how many lies I've been living. Um, like everything is just this insane layer of abstraction upon layer of abstraction and when you get down to the bottom like working through Donald Knuth in the art of computer programming it is a plate of scrambled eggs everything is pointing to everything else and it's uh, all really fast and really weird and doesn't have anything to do with the programming that I that I understood um, and so you know, at some level, it's occurring to me, at some level, everything on a computer that does not involve an individual running an infinite piece of tape back and forth in a Turing machine or flipping a light switch back and forth a billion times a second, everything's a skeuomorph. The fact that we have screens with words and pictures on them, the alphabet is a skeuomorph. I mean, why in God's name would we use some ancient technology that was originally used to track Sumerian grain yields on our brand new computers? 
by which I mean the alphabet. Except we like the alphabet. We think it's cool. We forget it's a technology. We don't think it's tacky or gets in the way. It's just good more if we're good with. And when you see people complaining about things like this, there's something valuable to learn. They believe that there's an essence to the computer, right? They believe there's this true and real and right way to do things, and they're promoting that. And they want to jettison the past in pursuit of this digital reality that's like in their heads. And I think we do this a lot, right? Like we fan for years it's been the internet fridge, or there's just always something that we should be doing instead. Um, but I personally have kind of, I don't believe that technology has an essence. I don't believe there is a right way. I think that basically everything that we do on computers is a skeuomorph built on top of binary arithmetic. And I do believe that every new technology is trying to sort of fill cultural absences. That's what we're really talking about, but ends up creating new spaces and new absences. It's last, it was iOS 7 cleaning up its lines and it'll be something else for iOS 8. And I think we impose our desires onto those absences because we're human and that's what we do. I want us to have time to relax, so I'm not going to read the lengthy section on file formats, but I can share it with you if you want. I do want to read, though, this is part of it. Um, if you ever get a chance, go read the Photoshop file description, how actual Photoshop files are put together. It's one of the most amazing cultural documents you will ever come across because it just has like 20 years of insane private to Adobe design decisions. And, and they've all, now they're kind of open. And uh, there, there was a um, open source image viewer for Mac OS X called Z, X-E-E. -E. And there's a comment in the code where, the, where Z is supposed to open up Photoshop files. And the comment is, at this point, this is the coder, I don't know his name. At this point, I'd like to take a moment to speak to you about the Adobe PSD format. PSD is not a good format. PSD is not even a bad format. Calling it such would be an insult to other bad formats such as PCX, <laughs> such as PCX or JPEG. No, PSD is an abysmal format. Having worked on this code for several weeks now, my hate for PSD has grown to a raging fire that burns with the fierce passion of a million suns. Now this poor guy. <laughs> the thing is, he's trying to unpack decades of decisions to make sense of them, but at this point, the Photoshop format, the most file formats at great age, in fact, it's more like this legal document. Parts of it are open to interpretation. The computer's the ultimate judge, but you never know how it's going to rule. And later, this guy writes in the same, in the same uh, set of comments, trying to get data out of a PSD file is like trying to find something in the attic of your eccentric old uncle who died in a freak freshwater shark attack on his 58th birthday. That last detail may not be important for the purposes of the simile, but at this point I'm spending a lot of time imagining amusing, amusing fates for the people responsible for this Rube Goldberg <laughs> of a file format. So you got to walk through that spec. It's amazing. It's an amazing document. It's a little bit like walking down Coney Island Avenue. It's a little bit like seeing that history just get piled up. And you can see all the layers and the mistakes made and the unfinished thoughts. And as long as you're not implementing, it's a great document. If you are implementing, you're going to want to kill yourself. But you can see Adobe as a thing in all of its best and worst aspects. And I think that's interesting. And I think we have the opportunity to actually look at that and see the document and, and understand where things came from um, because of the technical skills we have. And we should do that more often. So, someone tries to create a document format that works for the, the high energy physics community, that's Tim Berners-Lee, and they create the web instead. This absolutely amazing absence is brought into the world, this huge vacuum that everyone needs to fill in. And it's just a little footpath, and now it's as big as man. It's actually all the real estate in New York City is a little bit under a trillion dollars in value. The web is a two trillion dollar economy. So. It's twice as big as New York City. And a great puzzle, actually, a good thing to ask yourself sometimes is, would you rather own all of New York or all of the web? It's kind of a funny, like, I like to ask people that question. Anyway, back to this. We're still trying to rationalize the web. We're still trying to figure out that space that was created and make sense of it. And the recent effort, specifically HTML5, has been to make it into an operating system, to let it know about battery life and webcams and things like that. 
And, and maybe that will finally fill the gap. I mean, obviously that's kind of what, what Google really wants to do is, is create an OS that can also deliver documents great, but, but it's a different thing than it used to be. Who knows actually how that's all going to work out. And it's hard uh, for me particularly, I've been at this for a while, and I feel nostalgia for that old and smaller world. You know, the, the little world before there were all these millions of us, and it was just a few people playing around trying to figure out what this space was. It was this huge open territory. And if you look, and, and the word pioneers and territory and you know, so on and so forth, no one ever uses colonization, but we, were, we colonized the web. And there were just a couple blogs and, and really not that much software in comparison to how much there is now. And you would just stage things in production and it would all be fine. Um, or you would erase 30,000 accounts, which I did one day. It's, these things happen. And that's gone. You know, some of it's, it's good it's gone. Some of it's a little sad, but it's just basically now we're in a different world. You cannot stop things from moving. You can't stop people from talking and changing things. And, and sort of sometimes they build a dam and sometimes they create a glorious open frontier. Um, and at some level, I think it, 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 in terms of absences, it, what it really comes down to is, is the past, our shared past, this shared story that we're all trying to tell and figure out what happened yesterday, what happened 20 years ago, is the largest absence of them all. Thank you very much. Wow.